Good afternoon and welcome to the Scottish Parliament. I'm Alison Johnston, presiding officer of the Parliament. I'd very much like to welcome you to the 2022 Festival of Politics. I can see that there are faces who've been joining us um, for, for events that have taken place previously. Regular. Lovely to see you back again. Now this year we celebrate the festival's 18th year of inspiring and informing audiences from every walk of life with three days of engaging debate in a safe and respectful environment. We're delighted that you can join us to participate in this event with our panellists. It's brought to you in partnership with the John Smith Centre, whose mission is to promote the positive case for politics and public service. There'll be a chance, of course, to get very involved with questions and comments during this event. And if you're keen to share your thoughts on social media, please do so, and the hashtag is FOP 2022. I'm delighted today to be joined by Resham Katecha, Brian Taylor and Dr Fraser Macmillan. Resham Katecha is Head of Policy in Government Affairs, Europe, Middle East and Africa at WISE, a financial technology company. She's also Head of Engagement for Women to Win, an organisation working to get more women elected to Parliament and a board member of the John Smith Centre. Brian Taylor will be a very familiar face to many of you from his time as political editor of BBC Scotland. A writer, broadcaster and lecturer, Brian is now a columnist for the Herald and frequent broadcaster on politics and current affairs. And Dr Fraser Macmillan is a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Glasgow working on the Scottish Election Study, an academic project focused on Scottish electoral politics and voting behaviour. He obtained his PhD at the University of Strathclyde and regularly contributes his expertise to BBC Scotland election coverage. Now, before we, well, before we, we pass over to yourselves, I'm just going to put a couple of questions to the panel and I'm <coughs> going to kick off first by asking Brian. Brian, you've worked with and around politicians for many years. Do you trust them? <laughs> I, I, I was tempted to give a simple answer, no, but... Unfortunately, that would be rather too succinct and, you know, we've got 90 minutes, so uh, it might, it might, we might need a little bit more than, than just to say the simple no. I, I, I tend mostly to trust them. I tend mostly to trust them. I, I'd make two perhaps preliminary points that get us, get us going. First of, all, first of all, the atmosphere, the present atmosphere, the present environment, the present political environment, economic and social environment is the most uncertain, anxious and apprehensive I have ever encountered. And I've been a journalist, as you were kind enough to mention for, for one or two years. I've covered Scottish politics since Braveheart was a boy. Um, but but it, it, the atmosphere is incredible. It isn't just the hideous plague of two years of pandemic. It isn't just the pending recession, although those, those combined together, it isn't just Ukraine. It's the combination of all of these things. People are feeling, frankly, terrified, and they're perhaps looking for individuals to blame. And I believe in those circumstances of anxiety and disquiet, the chances of there being trust in the organisations that are seen to be running affairs and perhaps are seen to have contributed to, to the problems is likely to be low. Um, the, the, just the other, the other tiny, thing I'd, uh, tiny point I'd make as, as a sort of generic point is, is to say that the, the, the uh, politicians, that, that when, they, they, we, when we're asking whether we trust them, it's whether we trust them, whether we believe them, first of all, do we believe what they're saying? Well, that's, that's one thing. I think it's, it's whether we trust them to act in keeping with their own interests or in keeping with ours. And I think mostly they try to act in keeping with our interests. Because what? Because they want to get re-elected. And that, in, in, a, in a democratic system, that is the great clout. That, that you, you can see the, I think the phrase was once used, a, you know, a shiver run along the front bench looking for a spine to run up. And th that, is, that, is, that is the case with politics, when, 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 when politicians, when MPs are in the Commons, when MSPs here at Holyrood contemplate a political crisis, they contemplate it, frankly, in genetic terms, but also in terms of what's it going to mean for my seat? What's it going to mean for my chances of getting re-elected? And sometimes people think, well, that's awful, that's dreadful, they're thinking about themselves. But no, you think about it, it's the only way the electorate can imply a continuing sanction upon them between elections, is, is to, 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 to threaten them, frankly, with... with with, with getting, getting kicked out. And I, I think that's healthy in a democracy. Consider the alternative. The alternative they, they have no fear whatsoever of being removed, and that way you have totalitarianism. So I, I, I think, on balance, 
we are in a particularly dark age of an absence of trust. It may improve, but I think on balance that I, I, I trust them to a certain degree as long as we have, we're exerting that, that democratic and electoral control over them. Thank you, Brian. Um, Resham. That was a long, a long, much, much longer answer. <laughs> that. I should have stuck to no, it would have been better. <laughs> no, it, it's grand. We have plenty of time at the moment, at least. Resham, do we trust politicians? We hear a lot about how trust in politicians is declining. Is it? And if so, what's causing that decline? Uh, the answer to is it declining, uh, kind of from the evidence base, is yes, it is. Uh, IPPR did research showing that in the 40s, uh, the number of people or the percentage of people asked that believed politicians were out for themselves was about one in three. Uh, that went up in the early to mid 2014 time, around the tens, it went up to one in five, one in two, uh, and now that's up to two and three. So two thirds of people think that politicians are out for themselves. Um, and what does this mean? It just means that you are far less likely to believe that your politicians are acting in your best interest, that they are putting their own needs ahead of yours. Um, now, why is that? I think partly uh, it's the spread of social media. And I do think that's in some ways been a great leveler, a great equaler. Um, you didn't have to be uh, you don't have to be particularly educated, you don't have to be particularly uh, well connected to be able to either access or share your views. And I think that is fantastic. The democratising of people being able to share their views, to share access to what pol politicians say and do and how that impacts the world. Uh, but equally, that means that we are judging the world and what our politicians do uh, through often 280 characters or by clips that are taken out of context, which means that there is a, a real possibility for polarisation, a real possibility thanks to algorithms that you no longer see the other side, you no longer understand uh, the other view, and it is very easy to find material to prove your belief, should you wish to, yeah. that politicians change their mind or uh, do not stick to what they've said. And I think that's concerning because actually we want politicians to feel as though they are not going to be punished for changing their minds. Um, it is not healthy for democracy for us to beat people over the head if they change their political views or change their belief to the best solution to a problem we have in the UK. Uh, so I think actually we do have to recognise that that by incentivizing politicians to change their minds when more evidence comes out or to act in a different way, um, that is a good thing and will increase trust. But one of the biggest issues, I think, is representation. Um, and, you know, there are uh, fewer women than men in Parliament. There are even fewer people from different uh, social classes and backgrounds, people without university educations, people who have had experience experiences carers, uh, people who have had all sorts of experiences uh, and actually our parliament still does not look like the countries that it seeks to represent. Um, and so the more we can increase that, um, you know, Brian, you mentioned a really good point about do we believe that people in parliament are acting in their own best interests or in our best interests? The more we can converge those interests, the more we can make it that our interests are the same as politicians' interests, the better. And I think you can see that in decision making. Uh, it was, uh, you know, infuriating to me uh, that as a woman where facial hair is not considered something that is societally acceptable, uh, that my husband was allowed during COVID to get his facial hair dealt with far sooner than I was. Um, and that seemed crazy to me, but it was because it was mostly men uh, in the room making the decisions. And actually, if we'd had more women, if we'd had more ethnic minority women, uh, if we'd had people with different health conditions, maybe that view. And it sounds silly and small, but actually it's just one very easy example to make of where when our politicians don't look like and have the same experiences as us, we feel as though there's a them and an us. And then the final thing I'll say on that, uh, that I think we'll come on to uh, in more depth, is actually politicians need to hold themselves to a higher level of integrity and account. And actually, there has to be um, more account taken by people at the top of parliament, uh, all parliaments, uh, that actually, if people in your party uh, behave poorly or improperly, or if you do so yourself, there should be the integrity and the, the follow through uh, that you remove the whip or that you stand down from your position. Because actually, if we see there being one rule for us, one rule for them, it becomes much harder to convince people that politicians do act in our interests and hold themselves to the account that we expect. Thank you very much. And Fraser, your, your research focuses on, on voting behaviour, and I wonder how 
how, how that's impacted in terms of trusting politicians? So, in some ways, what, what we've spoken about so far, um, I think we're almost in danger of moving or aspiring towards an ideal that never really existed of this, this kind of platonic, like we all just get around the table and look at the evidence and have a nice discussion yeah. and then that's it. But the bread and butter of politics is disagreement. And it's more about finding a healthy outlet for that in a democratic society. Um, obviously, it can cause huge problems for democratic participation when people lose trust in institutions. And there's a difference between institutions per se, so you know, the Scottish Parliament or democracy in general, and the, the specific actors within that. Um, but what we've seen over the last kind of half century in Britain as a whole is a decline of trust in both. Um, to some extent, based on a couple of the trends you've talked about, it's much more difficult now, I think, for individual politicians to maintain that trust because the level of scrutiny is so high, because the expectations are often quite high, and it's inevitable you're gonna let people down. Um, in response to the kind of overall question of the panel, um, do you trust politicians? I'm gonna kind of be the contrarian here and argue the affirmative. Um, I suppose Brian sort of did, but it was a bit, you know, mixed with personal experience, like maybe, um, so I'm I, sitting on the fence, I've done it very comfortably <laughs> for about 40 years. <laughs> um, you know, generally speaking, uh, so my, my main area of research, at least until I joined the Scottish election study, was manifesto pledge fulfilment. And oh. believe it or not, politicians, generally speaking, fulfil the vast majority of what they promise to do. Um, the, the main kind of reasons for variation in that are basically how much power they wield as a party. So if you get a stable single party government with a majority, they'll go on to often do 78 and 90 percent of what they pledge to do in the manifesto. If it's a coalition government, obviously you're going to end up having compromises made. If there are you know, negative economic conditions, they need to change the, their policies away from what was promised. But people don't know that, right? People generally, if you ask people in, in survey questions, the vast majority of people don't believe that politicians fulfill their promises. Um, and in some ways, you know, we, we do want them to change their mind when conditions change. Um, but I don't think it's, it's something we can just, you know, say, oh, it's great, everyone fulfills our promises in the ether um, and expect people to be, oh, well, that's great. I love it. I, I, I trust politicians now. Um, it's much more all-encompassing than that. And I think the environment of the kind of modern, you know, modern democratic life across the world makes it much, much more difficult to kind of sustain that trust for a long time. And generally, kind of people have a negativity bias. They perceive, um, you know, negative events as, as more, like they weight them more in their thought process than positive ones. Yes. So they see the broken promises and they don't necessarily see the fulfilled ones. Um, but over time, governments just become unpopular. There's a concept in political science, as close to you can get as a law in social science, um, the cost of governing. The longer you're in office, the more trust and um, you know, your popularity gets chipped away. And that's just because you get blamed for everything. Uh, one of the only instances that that hasn't actually occurred is right here, uh, with the SNP government being in power for what, 14, 15 years now. Um, and they don't seem to have paid the cost of governing. Um, but maybe we'll get some more pertinent questions on that later on. <laughs> yeah, um, thank you all very much. Reshim, you, you spoke about the impact of social media on, I suppose, on how much people are aware of what their politicians are doing. We are just having a little discussion before we joined one another on the stage here about the fact that we know where party leaders are on holiday now and people may take a snap on a phone and the next thing we can all yeah. see it. So on this question of trust, do we, are we only talking about trusting politicians to do the right thing for the public? Or is it absolutely essential that politicians are trustworthy in their personal lives too? Um, I think I'll go to Resham first on that one. I thought you would. Um, <laughs> I think that's, it's, it's a really interesting question to me because I worked in parliament for a, for a baroness for a year and then uh, for a member of parliament in Westminster for two years. Um, and it was so interesting, the number of people who would write in saying, why can't we have 
MPs or MSPs who are just like us. Uh, and I found that really interesting because actually in everyday life, um, you know, I'm not, not, not going to ask for a show of hands if you know anyone who's had an affair or done something they shouldn't have done that oh, you would on, not... That would be <laughs> <laughs> well, why, why is that individual leaving? I, 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 come, come back, come back, sit down, it'll be fine. Um, but, you know, it was really interesting to me that that was uh, an issue because I would kind of say, so you want people like you um, yeah. apart from in all these certain circumstances. And of course, we don't want politicians who uh, break the law. We don't want politicians who will avoid taxes. But, um, you know, I think if you'd asked me that question 10 years ago when I was younger and saw things more kind of black and white, I'd have said, well, no, if you're going to have an affair, or if you're going to do X, Y, Z, then, you know, of course you're a bad person in every element of your life. And actually, the older I get, the more, you know, I realize that spectrums of gray um, does perhaps doing something inappropriate in your personal life, so long as it's consensual and not breaking the law, prevent you from being able to do what you think is best for your country or putting your constituents' interests first or representing a manifesto pledge and, and delivering that. Um, no, I don't think it no, does. But equally, culturally, um, you know, we live in a country where people still conflate the two. Um, you know, if you were to look at other European continental countries, that's far less of an issue. Um, so I don't personally think it means that you are incapable of being able to do your job with integrity. Um, but I think it's just a societal expectation that if you could do that to your loved one, you're going to do worse to the public. And I don't think that's true, but... Freezer? It's a, it's a tough one. In some ways, it's encouraging that, you know, people's assessments of Boris Johnson weren't really affected by the fact we don't actually know how many children he's got. Um, you know, things have moved on a lot in the last few decades. Um, and obviously, I think it would make, it makes sense to infer if somebody's personal conduct is extremely bad, then obviously they're not fit to, you know, govern or represent people. Um, but generally speaking, I think it's, it's good to have that kind of separation between the, the personal realm and the, the political one. Um, and yeah, voters care less and less about people's personal lives now. Um, so it's yeah, better that they evaluate them on what they actually do. And your view, Brian? We, we, Boris Johnson might have got away with it if it wasn't for the general atmosphere. Partygate was, was idiotic and, 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 and reprehensible. But he might have got away with it if it wasn't for the fact that around the country people were dying and were, were unable to see their, their, their sick relatives at the same time as, as the, the, the creative, crates of cider were being lugged into Downing Street. If he didn't think that that was a problem, then in my view he, he wasn't fit to be Prime Minister. He is desperate to be liked. He's always desperate to be popular. When he appears at party conference he likes to be the Jack the Lad in the comic the comic stand-up, but, but, he, he, but he, he, he got himself into the position of Prime Minister and still behaved in that same fashion. And he was obviously, he's obviously been brought, brought down by a, a, an individual who departed from his side, whom I will, will, will not name, but, but he, he, uh, I, I think he landed himself in some, some difficulty as a consequence. I think it is the atmosphere. If you look at the behaviour of, of individuals who have been in very high office in the UK, if you look at Gladstone, who used to rescue uh, w women of the night on a fairly regular basis. The question is how many he kept uh, is, is, is another matter. You look at Lloyd George, who won the First World War, but also contrived to, frankly, sell peerages on a fairly industrial scale. If you look at uh, the, probably the greatest of them all, Winston Churchill, who um, had, was in such financial difficulty that he had to do a deal with an, uh, American financiers to, to rescue the properties that, that he owned. These, these would never have been uh, leaders now, and I'm not. I'm not in any way defending that behaviour, and I'm not. I'm not defending the, the, the need for. I'm defending perhaps the need for, for for allowing some flaws and allowing some some humanity. But also, you, you you get people able to change their minds. I mean, we we had that 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 referred to earlier. The possibility of changing your mind. Again, the great example is Churchill, who was a conservative and then a liberal MP for the great and noble city of Dundee for 14 years, and then he switched back again to the Tories. And as he said himself, anyone can rat upon a party. It takes a certain amount of ingenuity 
continuity to re-rat. And I've, I've always, always liked that because it's the idea that, you know, who was it? It was Keynes, wasn't it? It said, when, when the facts change, I change my mind. What do you do, sir? And I, I, I think that we need to allow some degree of, of flexibility in that regard, but, but only some. Perhaps we've entered a, a society where the, the degree of tolerance is less. I also agree with the point that, that Fraser made, that there has to be a, a degree of controversy and contention. You do not settle things by sitting around a table and, and holding hands and having a group sing of Kumbaya. It just it does it doesn't work. You you you, the, you know you, you don't settle, for example, the question of whether we have the union or whether we have independence. That's kind of a big deal, and it's going to have to be resolved in in a different fashion and resolved by electoral choice. So what I would like to see is the electoral choice is presented frankly to the people and honestly to the people, and and the people being ready to accept those frank and honest representations, because at the moment it strikes me they're not, they're looking for fairy tales. On the question again of social media, yeah. um, I, I think we've all experienced some negative um, interaction there, and <laughs> it's a very difficult place to have a, a nuanced debate, in fact, quite frankly, it's, it's impossible. Just don't read it, presiding officer, it's no, the best way. No, just, actually, just, I, just I, I have to tell you I'm incredibly good at not reading well done, it. Well done, well um, done. Yeah, I'll, I'll, not, I'll not get into that at the moment, but, you know, there's a view that social media is based, well, it grows um, the more negative it is, yeah. it seems to. Um, negative engagement is a good thing as far as social media is concerned, it seems to be the case too often. Do you think there'd be more trust among politicians if they all switched off Twitter? I'll ask Fraser that first. That's very difficult to say. Probably not. Um, I think it would make politicians' lives easier. I think they're, they often perceive that they're being monitored by the public more than they actually are. Um, but because everyone in politics is a political obsessive, you know, if you're an MP, you are originally a nerd. So, <laughs> you, you know, you, you like Twitter because you get all the news straight away, it's yeah. good gossip, blah, blah, blah. They should probably stay away and just, you know, let someone on their team handle uh, things for them. Um, it would make their lives easier, but I don't think it would really make a dent in, in trust because in some ways it's less the, I mean, the individual ab ab abuse of uh, like MPs and, uh, you know, representatives and candidates is obviously a huge problem. <coughs> that comes from a pretty small minority of people. The, the, the big issue is, you know, people who don't really interact online and get kind of filtered in their own wee silos and you know, fall prey to the kind of psychological biases that we're all struggling with all the time, confirmation bias, um, getting sucked into your own echo chamber and things like that. Um, they don't post on comment sections, but they read the news and they get little notifications all the time. Um, and you know, my, my cousin was talking about how she's glad that my auntie's retired now so she spends more time in the garden and less on Facebook, <laughs> mainline and fake news. So. Um, <laughs> That, I think that is what has created a lot of the, the kind of current environment. Mm -hmm. It's a, a lot more accessible. Um, if you want to, quote unquote, do your own research, you can do it. There are no gatekeepers anymore. And I think that's kind of created a little bit of a crisis of institutional trust that maybe wasn't there before. Brian, what do you think would happen if all elected members came off Twitter? I, I, I think it would be healthy, frankly. I, I, I have a, a Twitter account which I have literally never used. Um, I, I've promised to tweet on the day that Dundee United win the European Champions League. Um, after Thursday, that's looking a bit less, un less, less likely, a bit less precipitous. But I'll, I'll, t I'll tell you what, I'll tell you, I'll tell you two, two, two anecdotes. I was sitting in Margot's bar downstairs with a very, very senior uh, uh, minister in the SNP, previous administration. And this individual said to me, why don't you tweet? And I said, I, I, don't, I, I can show you why I don't tweet. I said, send out a tweet saying you're having a drink with Brian Taylor. And I went, 10, 9, Eight, seven. We got to six, I think, and Flurry came in. What are you doing? You know, drinking with that traitorous git, and, and he's a he's a, he's a tra traitor to Scotland, and all this sort of thing. If it been if it been a Tory, I'd have got exactly the same on the other side, uh, which is 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 comforting. But there is a, I said, and the, 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 my interlocutor was astonished by this and said, you know, that can't be right. And I said, you know, well, welcome to my world. Um, so I, I don't, the, the other the other story is is, is not, a, not a story, a, a fictional story from. The West Wing. I'm sure you're all fans of the of the West Wing. Far, fabulous one, and it's the one where someone is, is determined to answer. You know, just obsessed with replying to the, this tweet.
tweet and, and CJ forbids him for, for, for doing it and says, I forbid you to do this. Some of these people may not have taken their medication today. And that, that's, a, that's a, th it's a thing to bear in mind. You, you don't know with whom you are interacting if you're interacting online. Now, I'm going to reverse from that and say that social media can be advantageous. It can be useful. It can give people a voice, as, as was said there. I, I generally haven't required a voice. I do, I do a column in the Herald. I, I, you know, was on the telly and the wireless, so I, I don't really need that. But 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 I, I can understand its its advantages. But I think its disadvantages are currently far outweighing weighing the advantages. And there's another element, if I can add, that that I am concerned about. I am concerned not just about social media, but I'm concerned about the point. I think the point you made a very good point about silos, because we are, we are we're beginning to hear the argument that there is there is no longer objective truth. There is your truth and my truth, and I can put forward an alternative truth. The most obvious example, example being uh, team, team Trump saying that they had the, the, the biggest turnout for an inauguration ceremony when he plainly didn't. And when it was put to them that they plainly didn't have as many as, for example, Obama or, or, or probably Lincoln, they, 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 they said, yeah, well, that's your truth. We've got an alternative truth. And they genuinely meant that. And I hear that a number of times saying we have an alternative to your perspective and it's I say but it's not an alternative opinion you know it's 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 objective fact if we can establish objective fact we can then argue about how you move forward with, with, with these with these facts but there is now because of I think social media and because of the the the, the, the silo um, point that you made so well I think there is now a situation where we have people genuinely believing what, what they see as opinion on 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 the confined areas and I think it's still relatively few people I hope it's still relatively few but I think we need to try and try and counter that in some way. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm a skeptic, a real skeptic of, of the advantages of social media, while I can see them being, uh, and online is, is, is of course uh, completely uh, excellent, available to all. Thank so you. People have even abused the Scottish election study Twitter account. Oh, hey. Eh? They don't know who's, it's, it's, just, it's just a flag and a name, you know. Yeah. Uh, they don't even know who's behind it. But yeah, we've been slagged from all sides, which I suppose suggests we're doing something Right. Yes. I mean, Reshan, what's your view on yeah. elected members being engaged on Twitter, on social media? I mean, I, I would uh, label myself the political geek you referred to. I, I wake up and before I've kind of even opened my second eye, I'm already on Twitter. Yeah. Um, but I think it should, Twitter is very much a read rather than a put out place because I actually think uh, you know as you mentioned you invite a lot of abuse and it's very easy you talked about the, the positive and negative and how we focus on the negatives actually I think when you get abuse on Twitter it's very easy for that to overwhelm you and you actually stop um, I, I obviously have never been an elected official but I have fought okay. two elections uh, and it, it becomes very poisonous I fought the first time in 2015 I had uh, organ surgery through oh, A&E, oh. totally unexpected, uh, and I was in hospital recovering from a very big surgery, and I had not that many, thankfully, and there were far more messages uh, that were, you know, wouldn't vote for you, but hope, you know, they needed to tell me they wouldn't vote for me, <laughs> but not going to vote for you, but I hope you live. And you're like, gee, thanks, that's a low bar, but thanks. Um, big deal. But, but there were, you know, probably 10, uh, either Twitter DMs or emails um, that were, you know, I hope you die, you effing Tory, you know, blah, 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 kind of whatever choice of swear words that they chose to use. And actually, it was really, really hard because, you know, you have to have a thick skin when you're in politics, but there are times when you're vulnerable, there are times when you're weak, yeah. uh, there are times when you don't have, you know, as I did at that time, not have... Uh, the physical and mental strength to deal with that. And actually, I was horrified, lying in hospital, thinking, like, who are oh, these people cool. that hate me this much, that they have taken time out of their day to open up Twitter and think, oh, I know what I'll do today. I'll tell someone I hope they die. And I actually found that really surprising, and I stopped reading uh, the responses to my tweets. I would yes. tweet stuff because mm -hmm. I thought it was important to say, hey, this is where I'll be, or this is what I'm doing. Um, but when I fought in 2017, it was a target seat. I was selected, um, moved straight to the constituency, and uh, I was new to the constituency. I'd never lived there. So I started sharing Facebook videos and Instagram videos. Um, and actually, it was incredible. What I could have done for £5,000 with, with a leaflet drop to every house, I could do, uh, you know, I spent £50 on at pushing, promoting a Facebook video, and it got 50,000 views. And actually, that meant 50,000 views with postcodes in my constituency okay. got to learn who their candidate was. Um, obviously not 
thousands enough to win. <laughs> um, but at least it meant that it opened up that people who wouldn't have been able to know who their candidate was could know. So I do think there's some value add. Um, but I think here is where big tech has to do more. I mean, I have it's worse for women, it's worse for BME people, and it's the worst uh, for poor Diane Abbott. Um, but if you are a woman, um, it is a case of when, not if, you will get death threats uh, as not even a politician, as, as a candidate. And as a candidate, and forgive me if you already know this, I didn't. Um, when you're a candidate, you're not paid. Uh, in fact, uh, the research shows that in 2015, so it's positive, possibly more expensive now, but in 2015, uh, the cost to a candidate of fighting a target seat, as I thought in 2017, was on average 18 to 19,000 pounds. That's in accommodation. So when I fought Coventry, uh, I had to move from London to Coventry. Accommodation, transport, uh, lost earnings. You have to arrange fundraisers because no one gives you money to spend on the leaflets that you're expected to distribute. Um, so you have to fundraise. You then have to pay for raffle prizes for your fundraiser, which you then have to buy tickets for to show that you are supporting your fundraiser. For, and, and then you can't keep the prize because you know you have to give that to someone else. Um, so the whole thing is just ludicrously expensive. And so we talk about um, the challenge for candidates. The safety is one, the cost is one. And then actually big tech should just have to take more responsibility. There is, if you can take a photo of a woman breastfeeding down within an hour, yeah. why can you not take down accounts I that send death threats and rape yeah. threats. Why is the solution to tell a candidate to wear a panic button? Why is the solution to tell a candidate who's had their tires slashed and a swastika daubed on their driveway, as happened to a friend of mine, that she should find somewhere else to live for the rest of the campaign? Why is the solution to telling an MP who's taken maternity leave and is receiving death threats on social media to tell her to not read it? And I think actually these are really big issues because the worse it gets, the fewer people, understandably, are going to want to do this because if you have a good career and some sanity, you're probably thinking, I'd rather not give up my life for that level of abuse. Mm -hmm. And when we've seen two MPs be murdered, um, you actually realise that it's not just a case of saying, this is something that's on social media, just ignore it, because the reality is it might come off social media into your real life. And I, I know I've taken that to a very dark place, but I do no, think, sorry, <laughs> I do think that's important. It's hideous. Yeah. No, it's, I mean, we're here today to discuss trust hideous. in politicians. But yeah. Yesterday I was chairing a panel which was about making sure that we continue to attract women into, into politics mm -hmm. because we don't have enough at the moment. We, we don't have a parliament that looks like the people. Um, so I, th I think your comments are, are very, very pertinent indeed. I'd very much like to, to come to you now. Um, Pleased to see how many people have joined us this afternoon. Mm -hmm. So, if you'd like to raise to, to ask a question, if you could raise your hand or just to make a comment, um, if there's a particular panel member you'd like to direct your question to, please say so, um, and we'll we'll keep this discussion going. We have a we have a hand up here. Hello. I'm sorry. I, I just feel it's a very light-hearted discussion, and I feel we're living in an appalling state of politics in the UK. If you look at let go back to Brexit, the lies that were told to people, and and you know, and what has the result been? And these people are all in, you know, people are in power as a result of that. Their deception, you know. Do you trust politicians? No, and you know, well, certain politicians, yeah, but you know, it's. I don't think it's a light-hearted matter at all. I think we've got the energy crisis. You would think that was happening on another planet. The government, the UK government is kind of on holiday, isn't it? The leadership elections happening and nobody's addressing it. And there's, you know, there will be people losing their lives because of this energy crisis. There's no action being taken. They're not seriously addressing it. They're not looking at, you know, f the f government in France. They've been making proper, you know, taking proper steps to protect people. I don't think, the, you know, our government in Westminster is interested in protecting its citizens, quite frankly. And it just makes me furious, you know, I think the whole thing, sorry, I'm just ranting, but, you know, no. I think the answer is no, they have to work for the public. Yeah, I, mean, I don't think they are. I mean, I suppose we, we've been setting the scene about the, the atmosphere in which debate is taking place, in which politics... 
politicians are working, but here's a question. This They're is not a, getting it, Adam. Th this is a question. Of the, um, the UK had a vote on an issue that was put to them. Policies were described in a certain way. Um, I'd be very interested to hear what you think, Brian, about the gentleman's comments. Uh, you, you're plainly disappointed by the, the, the Brexit outcome, and so the, therefore the, there's going to be a certain degree of... of, no, of it's not of, just the outcome, but the stories that were told that were just lies. Uh, well, but, 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 well, perhaps it should have been pointed out rather more vigorously by their opponents <laughs> had, had that been the case. I think the Treasury were perhaps um, asleep at the wheel on, on that one, and I take no view as to whether it was wise or otherwise to... To, to leave the, the, the European Union. I, 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 I can understand your anxiety, and it, it was by no means a rant. It was, an, it was a, a, a plea for, for sanity and for a transformation of politics. I agree with you with regard to the, the, the state of the problem. I think, as I said at the outset, I've never seen anxiety like it, as, the, as there is at the, the present moment. It is quite staggering, and once the energy bills kick in, it's going to be uh, 100 times worse. But I don't think, I do not think, that either the UK government or the Scottish government are, are sitting back and rubbing their hands and ignoring it or going on holiday. I really don't think that. I think the, um, the, the, the contrary is the case. They're trying their level best to, to find some ways of addressing it. But the problems are absolutely gigantic. The, the problem of the economy is huge. The problem of the energy bills is huge. And the, the, the problems, perhaps the attendant problems caused by Brexit are uh, currently in, in, insoluble because, fr frankly, Brexit has gone ahead and we have to find a way of accommodating uh, that. I, I, I do think our politicians are trying. I think the, the, the governments are trying, plural are trying. I think the civil servants who work for them are, are trying and struggling, but they are currently finding it impossible to turn back the tide of crisis that we are facing. And I don't think it's going to get any better in, in the near uh, situ situation where you have the Bank of England forecasting a recession lasting 14, 15 months or longer. Fraser? Yeah, I mean, I, I have a lot of anxiety about the fact that we're going into a kind of once-in-a-generation crisis and having just emerged from a once-in-a-century pandemic, uh, which has obviously contributed to that a lot. Um, and I think there's a huge amount of uncertainty about what that'll mean um, you know, for politics as a whole, but also just for society. It is a giant, an enormous social crisis we're facing. And I think the, the thing I found very disappointing about the Tory leadership election is, obviously leadership elections, because of the nature of them, the party has to, the, the candidates have to appeal to the selectorate. So in this case, the Tory members. So they need to say things that the Tory members will like. Um, and that's why they're doing all this, you know, Thatcher LARPing and, um, you know, trying as, as hard as possible to, you know, take on that mantle and um, making pledges that, to be honest, are not really fit for the kind of scale of the crisis. And I think I, I share a lot of the anxiety there. Um, in, in some ways, it's, it's probably just bad timing, but I don't think at the moment governments in... Um, you know, like long in the tooth industrialised democracies really have the, the luxury of ideological purity. Um, we had a test of that during the pandemic and obviously to some extent there was, you know, um, unprecedented public spending from a conservative government. On the other hand, um, you know, I think Rishi Sunak only became popular because of decisions he was forced at gunpoint to make. Uh, and he resisted the impulse to do anything that would deviate from the kind of core Tory ideology, um, at least in the first year or two. Um, so I'm, I'm not entirely sure what I'm trying to say here. I am also very worried and don't know what's going to happen. Uh, and we'll just, we'll, yeah, it's the, the culmination of a lot of different um, kind of factors. And it's not, it's not even like the 70s where um, there's, a, there's a book by an American sociologist, Robert Putnam, called Bowling Alone. Um, some of you might have heard of that. And it kind of traces the downfall of associational life in the United States. And a similar kind of thing's happened here, right? We used to have mass membership trade unions and parties. Um, you know, a high share of the population went to church. We've become a lot more atomized, um, thanks in some ways to technological progress and secularization um, and, you know, individual, you know, material gain. Um, but at the same time, we're not necessarily equipped as much to deal with a kind of huge economic shock because we're yeah, a, lot, a lot more kind of individualised in some ways. 
Um, and there's also, you know, things like the housing crisis have been decades in the making. Um, and that's partly because of, you know, successive governments following a... This, this is what I, I really struggle with, is that the democratic kind of incentive for, you know, governments who wanted to represent the, the wishes of the general public was to push up house prices. But over decades, a policy of pushing up house prices is a completely insane housing policy that, you know, it ends up resulting in what we've got now, which is like people not being able to afford anywhere to live, um, young people can't get a house, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and, you know, paying through the nose for rent. And these are the kind of issues that you can't just solve in one or two elections either. Um, and they need, it's so cliche to say, it needs a bold, radical new vision, right? We kind of know all the various options on the table. We know what the tools are. But the question is whether we have political elites that are actually up to the challenge. And that's something that I'm quite concerned about. Yeah, I think, um, you know, Brian mentioned earlier the need for political parties to ensure that the electorate have all the information they need before them. And there was real frustration there from our contribution from, from the audience about, yeah, how well informed people are when, you know, these big decisions are being debated and discussed. And we obviously, you know, I've previously been a member of a polit political party and, and debate is, is based on that discourse and it has to be an open and frank one. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so your frustration there, there's a lot going on at the moment. We have the energy crisis, the cost of living crisis. There is a, an internal party election for, for the country's next prime minister. Um, and, and we have recess too. I'd be interested to hear your response, Reshan. Uh, so I think that was a, a great question and two really valuable follow-ups because I think it's it's triggered a few different things for me. Um, I was born in 89, I'm a millennial. Uh, kind of the first political thing that I really followed, um, other than Tony Blair being elected when I was eight, but only because my dad was very unhappy uh, about that. <laughs> so I just remember him uh, on election day. But really, it was Iraq. Uh, then it was the financial crisis and the, and the crash after that, graduating into that in 2010, uh, a real struggle. Then, of course, oh, we had some expenses scandal. Then we had uh, the repercussions. Then we've had COVID, then we've had uh, kind of everything that's happening right now. And I think if you look at my generation and younger, um, you know, we keep hearing this once in a generation, once in a generation. And we're like, we are one generation yes. and we are having multiple crises. It's like crisis after crisis. Yeah. Um, there does not feel like there's any stability. And actually, I've been reading studies about the state of anxiety a lot of um, people, kind of my generation and younger, feel. And I know, you know, you say this and sometimes people say, oh, you know, you didn't live through the war. And of course we didn't. And that's, you know, a valid point to some extent, but equally the reality is um, from a political stability point of view, it feels like we just career from one thing to the next and you're barely out of COVID and suddenly it's like, okay, how will we pay heating bills? And we're on to our, I don't even know how many number of prime ministers, uh, you know, since 89. And it's just, it, it feels very unsettled and very unstable. And I think the reality is um, that actually we have some very big problems. And I don't think often that those are communicated to the electorate the way they should. Um, by politicians, by the media, by anybody, because actually the housing crisis, um, the social care issues, climate change, the NHS, all of these are huge, complex, um, decades long in the making and will require decades in the fixing issues. They are not something that can be fixed in one electoral cycle. But as Brian mentioned earlier, MPs need to be re-elected in order to maintain their careers. You, you know, you can't be an MP if you lose the election uh, and therefore you can't make change. So you are incentivized to think and talk about what you can do or achieve in three to five year cycles which means actually you're not incentivized to do things that don't show results before the next election or in the near future after the next election. Um, and actually, I think, you know, we talk, you mentioned needing creative solutions. Um, some of them are things a government could do with a majority big enough. You know, why not allow young people uh, to use their rental payments uh, on time to work towards their credit score? Why shouldn't that be evidence that you could pay a mortgage if you've always paid your rent? Some of those will require decades long solutions and cross party working. And whether that's an independent body or an internal parliamentary system that enables that solution to be created, actually we're going to have to do some of that working together. Um, we talk about um, 
people voting and engaging, um, younger people are far more likely to think about singular issues rather than they are about uh, allegiance to a political party. Um, so how can we talk to people who are not interested, not engaging, not voting in a way that actually connects and encourages that engagement. Um, and as part of that, you know, I know schools do some teaching on politics, but I mean, I left school, uh, I did A-level economics, so I did learn about, you know, fiscal taxes and fiscal policy, but, but actually so many people graduate at 18 are suddenly told, here, you can have a vote, but we don't actually teach the difference between the deficit and the debt. We don't teach, you know, how taxes work or interest rates or inflation. And it's like we expect that you get to your 18th birthday and suddenly these big things that will impact every element of the way you live and work for the rest of your life, uh, we just expect people to, to miraculously learn that. And then the final point I'll make um, is actually we need really strong opposition. Uh, and actually, it is unhealthy, in my view, to have a democracy where your opposition is weak. And I think it's personally less relevant how long you've been in government if you have a strong opposition to hold you to account. Although, of course, I think turnover is healthy. Um, but actually, you need a strong opposition to point out where you are saying things that are not factually correct or where you've misinterpreted them. We need, you know, fact-checking bodies to, to receive more attention. So for everyone in this room, um, if you aren't already doing it, check fact-checking websites. And the next time you share something, share that, because actually we can educate each other uh, and lift each other up from kind of being fed things that are incorrect. So, yeah. yeah. Fact checking. I think that's something I feel as if I'm beginning to hear more about more and more about this yeah. in in my own role. But the thing is, of course, someone puts out a piece of information, and it's it's you know it's around the globe in mm -hmm. in seconds. So there's a big big challenge there, and I think it is something we have to address from the earliest stage of education. You know, from the earliest appropriate stage. Now, who would like to ask? The next? This is this is fabulous. I'm going to. Um, well, we, we will try and get to all of you, but I'm going to put the onus on our assistant. Thank you. Thank you. Um, there's so many things, however, keeping this fairly brief. Resham, you you are reminding me of something really important, which is that these are huge, huge things that will take a long, long time. And I feel so emotional because I've always really trusted politicians on the whole. Um, my daughter works in Westminster. We're, but I think I question the, the whole, I question the whole basis of this because we need this common purpose, this common good to work for decade after decade towards things, not three to five years, etc. So to me, it just, I don't know, I don't know where politicians are in, in the scale of things, in these huge, huge scales. I don't know why so much power is lying with them. And that's my main point there. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I'll, I'll, can I take a maybe, I'll, I'll try and take, I'll take another question as well, three, and then yeah. I'll take two or three. Yeah. Um, can we go to the, the back row there? <laughs> Yes, I just wondered, um, one of the most infuriating things to me is when you meet someone who says, oh, I never vote, they're all the same, and, and nothing changes. Yeah. And obviously that's caused by an alienation and some of the behaviours of politicians. But it's also ridiculously um, irresponsible, because we need to take responsibility for our democracy. You know, and the, oh, they're all the same argument is completely wrong. And I just wondered... Do you think it would change our politics if we had compulsory voting like, like they do in Australia? I think you have a, you get a small fine if you don't take part in the election. And at least that might, with all the pros and cons, force people to take ownership of their own democracy. And, and I'd be interested to know what you thought of that and how you think our politics would change if everyone had to vote. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I'm going to take one final question. I think it's the third or fourth row here. The fourth row hand here. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Hi there. Thanks very much. Um, two slightly related questions. 
Fraser, could you expand more on why the SNP have uh, broken the, the one rule that they're supposed to be in um, maintaining power for so long? And also, I think something that's not really been spoken to in this context, given we are in Scotland as well, is the impact of the constitutional question in then what parties and politicians feel in terms of their security, because we've been in a bit of a deadlock for quite a while now um, with the uh, with lots of things happening, but then the constitutional question, maybe this is disagreeable, over determining the politics and maybe as a barrier, but also there's reasons for that. So if you could speak to that as well, it'd be great. Okay, thank you. So three very interesting questions there. Um, I think the first one, I just got the impression you really want to trust your politicians. Yes. I suppose there's something there about knowing your politicians and it's fair to say that in other countries standing for election is, is more normal. Um, it, you know, for example, they may have far smaller areas of governance at local authority level. Um, you know, the, there's, mm. there's very good work being done on this, you'll be well aware of it. You know, one in every few hundred pe people will have stood for election. I mean, I know when I decided I was going to get into politics, no one I knew, you know, was involved. It was pretty unusual. It seemed like, you know, a fairly extreme thing to do. So I think we have to normalise that and make sure if our candidates are people that, that we know and we've maybe grown up with and they've got a sort of, you know, just broad base in the, in the constituency or region they represent, I think that helps. It's that accountability and just, just feeling you have someone who is like you representing you, um, a point that Resham has made. I think the, the, the uh, question about one of the um, great th things I'm privileged to do in my role is to meet speakers from across the globe and um, recently met the speaker from the parliament in Western Australia. So we have had a little discussion about that, um, you know, how they ensure that great, greater level of engagement with that particular aspect of democracy. So well worth a, um, a discussion on and obviously, yes, the constitutional question. Well, I'm going to stop talking there and pass over to, to we'll, go to, we'll go to Fraser and then Resham and then Brian on, on these. Hi, so um, in response to why do we give politicians so much power, I mean, I think Alison made a good point in that local authorities in Scotland and also the UK as a whole are way too big um, and they should be, you know, broken up into much smaller units um, and that tends to be healthy for, you know, aggregate level political trust um, in empirical studies. Um, but the reason that representative democracy, it's that we'll have it. You know, it's it's kind of like the old, you know, least worst option thing. Um, in Switzerland, for example, they have lots of referendums. Um, they have you know quite a strong emphasis on direct democracy in the cantons and the federal level. But the participation in those is extremely low. People just don't have the capacity to make that many kind of minor decisions and if you are somebody in Switzerland that has a pet issue and you'd like to get a certain outcome it's actually quite easy to do it even though most people disagree because they're just so fatigued with having to constantly make these calls that they know nothing about that you can kind of force something through if you have a few hundred folk in your area that want to do it um, and to some extent we see that reflected here where, where you know um, the, the housing crisis is a particular bugbear of mine and we see that with kind of nimbyism here um, you know, the planning system puts far too much um, power in the hands of a small number of people who are very, very invested in preventing developments from happening. And it means because there's a lack of centralised control, at aggregate level you end up, you know, falling far behind on the number of homes you should be building. Um, so, to some extent, we can't really avoid having representatives as the kind of vehicles for, you know, public sentiment. Um, whether, you know, electing people in a certain way, as we do in the UK or Scotland, at four or five year intervals, is the, the absolute kind of apex of that, I'm not entirely sure. Um, and I suppose that kind of brings me on to the next question about Australia. They, they have much shorter terms of three years. Um, so in some ways it means if a government's performing badly and people want to get rid of them, it's much easier to do that because elections happen more frequently. But that also has the, you know, you've got a trade-off there of the kind of short-termism um, becomes even more acute. Um, and I think that would probably explain why they've been such climate laggards because 
the government's never been incentivized to do anything about it until obviously the whole country went up in flames right after the last election. Um, in terms of compulsory voting, actually, I'm, I'm assuming there's a political science literature on this. Um, I would, if, if you're feeling very uh, anarchy, you could punch it into Google Scholar um, and look at some abstracts of papers, you know. Um, compulsory voting, political trust. I'm, I'm assuming it probably has some impact on it at the margins. But again, there's a kind of trade-off in the sense of, do you want people who are very disengaged from politics and don't care about it vote, being forced to vote? It might be better that people self-select out uh, to some extent um, and that you don't slap them with fines for it. Um, so, you know, it's, you, I think you always have to kind of think of the counterfactual um, and, and weigh up the kind of positives and negatives. And then on the, the constitutional stuff, why the SNP haven't paid the cost of governing is essentially because they were initially elected in 07, it was kind of by surprise that people were expecting Labour to remain the largest party. Um, and they got in because people, kind of swingy voters, decided that they represented, you know, a, a kind of more competent managerial governance for Scotland. And that was driven by the perception that, that originates way further back that the SNP would stand up for Scotland better. There's a concept in political science called valence, which means managerial ability. Um, so if, if you vote on that basis, and that, that's become increasingly common in the last sort of half century in British politics, um, you know, you're not so much deciding on ideology, it's about whether you think they'll do the best job. But the SNP had an inbuilt advantage because people perceive them as capable of sticking it to the, the Westminster government, which at that point was obviously Labour, they were becoming more unpopular. Then you had the Tories come in, and that allowed the SNP to kind of draw a stronger contrast. Then, because they got the majority in 2011, on the basis that people perceived that they'd done a good job in those four years, they activated the constitutional issue, which completely reshaped Scottish politics. So one in three SNP voters in 2011 was at least nominally against independence. That dropped to, I think, about one in 10 um, in 2016 at the next time asking. And it's fallen even further since then. So what we've seen over the last kind of decade since the constitutional issue was activ activated is a, a sort of extreme issue polarization on that one particular topic. And in the SES, the Scottish election study survey data last year, I think it was 87% of people voted basically in line with their constitutional preference. So if you're a yes person, you almost certainly will vote yeah for the SNP at the constituency, and then SNP or Green in, on the list. Um, if you're a no person, it depends who you're kind of more instinctively aligned with, but um, there's an increasing degree of uh, strategic voting among no people to try and keep the SNP out. And that was effective in the sense that it prevented them from getting an, an overall majority last year. Um, and that's essentially why they've been able to evade that, at least until now. I think they are encountering some issues, and I can see in the next kind of five, ten years, they might start to bear some of those costs, because it's just the A, the constitutional thing just continues rumbling on. Um, and people, even very enthusiastic people on either side will get very bored of it. Um, and they've now got more power than they had before, which means you know, they carry the can for more decisions. And things like the ferries, are th that, that's the sort of thing that chips away at people. Um, but even then, you know, things that were criticized for before last year's election, like uh, education policy, for instance, if you look at the breakdown in the Scottish election study data along um, you know, people, people's yes and no support, Folk who support yes generally still rate the SNP pretty highly on education. And folk who support no rate them really negatively. So we've got this kind of polarisation going on from that originates in the constitutional issue, but gets filtered down into the party system. Um, but they might begin to to struggle in the next few years, especially if Labour can kind of find a, a kind of balanced, finessed position on the constitution that appeals to more habitual SNP voters. So yeah, sorry, I've gone on for ages and ages there. No, that's fine. Interesting three questions. I will have, yeah, probably ask for a bit more brevity now because <laughs> we've still got folk wanting to 
to, to contribute, Resham and then Brian, on these three points. Yes. Trust, I'll mandatory do it, voting, um, I'll do it constitution. Um, I have very little to add on the third one uh, that you haven't already said. Um, all I w would add is that um, I think we saw with the Brexit vote that when you have a government that is able to blame another government or another uh, kind of parliamentary body for its issues, uh, you are able to push away some of the blame. So the UK government has for decades blamed the European Union for issues it didn't want to take responsibility for itself. And I think to some extent the SNP has been able to blame Westminster for uh, issues that it does not want to take responsibility for. But other than that, absolutely nothing to add. Um, no, you're right to add that because they have the, the inbuilt advantage of being able to say if something goes wrong, they say this is why we need independence, right? Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Uh, and I, I think the parallels are really interesting to see um, to see on that. Uh, in terms of compulsory voting, um, inst I've read no evidence on it. Instinctively, I feel very uncomfortable making that compulsory. Actually, I would much rather that we go the carrot way um, instead of the stick and actually incentivise people to engage in politics, make it interesting. Um, I, where I lived uh, until last year in London, I got on very well with my MP and I said to him, look, you're a lovely guy, uh, but you are much older than the people going to the schools that you go in to talk to. Um, you know, your father was an MP, you come from a, a very privileged background. They're going to look at you and think, I see no parallels. Why don't you take me with you? And so he took me to schools with him to talk. And it was really interesting. You know, I'd never won an election. Uh, I didn't have MP after my name, but it was really interesting how young people people reacted to having someone who'd stood for parliament, even though it was unsuccessfully, tell them about what it was like and what you could do. Um, and so I think, A, having a more representative parliament would make people think, actually, this is something I want to engage with, something I want to vote for. I see someone who looks like me in parliament. Uh, I see someone who comes from my background. Uh, that would make them engage more, but actual active participation and encouraging that engagement. So getting MPs to go and speak at schools more. Some of them do a great job and do it all the time. Others don't. Um, but I think that I would much prefer to compulsory voting. And then on you, um, you know, I have to say, I hope your daughter likes it. I loved my time working in Westminster. When I started working in Parliament, it was not with the uh, ambition of wanting to be in frontline politics. I actually was very passionate about development policy. And I say that because uh, I just want to explain the context that when I went to Parliament, I had a very poor view of politicians. I thought, oh gosh, they're all in it for themselves. I'm only here to work on development policy. Um, and I worked in Parliament three years and I've spent many years since trying to get other people to work in Parliament. Um, and actually, I have to say that 98% of the MPs I interacted with over the past decade have absolutely been in politics for the right reasons. Um, you know, that they genuinely believe in public service, they believe in wanting to change the country. They don't all agree with how to do it, and I think that's the beautiful thing about democracy, but actually they got into politics wanting to serve their community, serve their country, and actually if you talk to MPs about why they got into politics, um, you'll hear stories from, I had cancer, my child uh, you know, had an accident, my parent needed care, and I, I decided I need to change the system. Most of them will have reasons that drove them into wanting to make a change, and the reality is, change is very difficult. Um, it's not for a lack of wanting to create positive change in many cases. Um, often the system is slow and it doesn't allow it uh, because you run out of debating time. So the online safety bill that would make platforms have to challenge some of these issues we've talked about, that's just been delayed uh, till after recess. And, and that's not because people didn't want to make positive change, it's just because of the system. So I'd say, have faith, have hope, uh, tell your daughter to stand for parliament too. Um, but, but actually I do think lots are in that. And I do have to give a plug right now for the John Smith Centre, of which I'm very proud to be on the board of, because actually, um, you know, one of the things we talked about, do politicians represent us and do the right thing? Um, you know, the John Smith Centre and, and plenty of other organisations do internships for people uh, from backgrounds that are not heavily represented in politics because actually what that does is even if they decide not to stand themselves it increases engagement it shows them that there is a place for them at the political table uh, but it does also mean that they are more likely to stand and understand how to do it um, so the more we can do that and open up politics to people rather than making it feel like it's the reserve of the rich, privileged and highly educated, the better it will be for the country. 
carrot or stick, Brian, when it comes to mandatory voting? You know, uh, William Sullivan's book, Missing I, Million, people who never vote in Scottish elections. You I, know, think, I think probably, what are we not offering? I think probably carrot. I mean, the, the, the latest social, Scottish Social Attitudes survey said that 94% of people thought it was important to vote. The turnout, the last election to this parliament was 635 uh, So there's a bit of a bit of a gap there, but I can understand that. When I, when I was working for, for the BBC, I was always very careful never to say to people, please go and vote tomorrow or, 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 or today or whatever, but because I, I felt that would be wrong, I think the wrong thing to do, it's, it's a personal choice. But I, what I tried to do was to say, um, in a, in a, a, a gentle way, uh, there, there are consequences in not voting. If you, if you boycott a supermarket because you don't like their products, then they will, if enough of you do that, they will notice the difference and they will change their ways. If you boycott an election, the, the, the elected will simply govern without your consent and they will carry on governing, and all that has happened is that you have not amended the, the overall pattern of, of voting at all. So I, I'm, I'm still in favour of it being uh, a, a voluntary matter, but I, I, would, I would agree strongly that we should try and gather as much information as we can, but I think that's often down to the elected as well, rather than uh, to the electorate, where, rather than uh, down to those of us who are trying to disseminate information. I think people need to find out more for themselves and ask the tough questions. To, to our friend here, I would simply say have faith uh, and, and, and ex exhort, I would exhort you to, 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 to bear in mind that it's perhaps not as bad as it seems. The current crisis is dreadful, but the, the political um, structure is perhaps not as, as bad as it seems. I'm going to address perhaps most of my remarks, if I can, to the the point about about the the, the constitution and the constitutional divide. Um, Fraser is entirely right. There, there is a core fault line in Scottish politics, which has generated the, this 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 complete division and people voting on on constitutional lines. It's entirely reasonable. It's a gigantic question as to whether Scotland is to be an independent uh, country, to use the phrase from 2014, or whether it's to remain part of the union, or whether it's to be reform of the union. It is a gigantic issue, and you not you not solve it in in a, in, a, in a small way and Therefore, I think that it's understandable that that dominates Scottish politics, but it doesn't just do so for the SNP. It has done so for the, the opposition parties. What, what happened was that the people, people moved from thinking in, in a UK way to thinking about Scotland. When they were taking the decisions about politics, it used to be, what will this do for the UK or GB or Britain or the government or Westminster, whatever. They started thinking, what's it going to do for Scotland? And increasingly, you saw parties um, literally putting a kilt upon their approach in, in, in Scotland. Um, this, th there was this sense of Scottish identity that came to the fore, and it came to the fore, and it, it became more um, preeminent. And that, same, that, that central sense of Scottish identity created the SNP in the first place, 1934, an amalgam of two previous parties, one Tory and one, one of the left. Uh, it, it created the SNP. It obliged the, the Labour Party and the Liberal Democrats to act with the creation of this this parliament, this devolved parliament, John Smith, to whom we referred, called it unfinished business. I think that business is still still unfinished, uh, certainly as far as the SNP and the Greens are concerned. So it did those two things, but it all but obliterated the Conservative Party. It obliterated the Scottish Conservative Party, all but. They lost every single seat in 1997, two years before this parliament was created. And they, they, were, they, were, they were the party of the patriots. They were waving the flag. Boy, were they waving the flag. It was just that for the Scottish electorate, they were increasingly waving the wrong flag. They were waving the Union flag rather than the Saltar. People were clutching the Saltar and beginning to think about what it does for Scotland. I do not mean that in a nationalist way. They were thinking, what do policies mean for Scotland? And, and the, the, the Labour Party would say, this is what it means for Scotland. But they're looking over the shoulder at what Tony or Neil or whatever thinks. The Conservatives were saying, no, we don't want this. We, we don't want that approach. We want a UK approach with the party of the union. It was only the SNP that was able to say, we are thinking ineluctably and without any, any peradventure about what this means for Scotland. We stand for Scottish interests. But cleverly, instead of uh, people say they pick fights with Westminster, and they do, and it's right that they say, you're quite right in saying that if they find something to, to blame and, and say this is Westminster's fault, sometimes it is Westminster's fault, to be absolutely frank, but sometimes they use it as an excuse. But if people, you know, you say that they pick, pick constant fights with Westminster, really? Really? Have they annexed Berwick, for example? <laughs> Have they marched upon Derby? I mean, that's the sort of thing the Scots used to do. They haven't done any of that sort of thing. <laughs> actually, what they've done, what, actually, what they've done is from, from 2007 on, as a deliberate act of policy, sought to govern consensually within, within um, the, the powers given to them, while simultaneously saying, if we can do this with devolution, just imagine what we could do 
with independence. But I mean, think, think more, more, more seriously about that. Have they refused to set a tax rate in Scotland? Have they withdrawn from, from Westminster? Have they taken any of these steps at all that, for example, parliamentary parties in Ireland in the run up to 1922 did? None of those, none of those whatsoever. They have governed within the system, they have worked within the system while trying sim simultaneously to change the, the, the system. And that is why, and the, the Conservatives have come back into prominence, they've become the, 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 the leading opposition party, not by standing on policies of taxation, education or whatever, but by standing as the party of the union and say, say that trying to arrogate to themselves, to corral to themselves all the pro-union votes it worked up to a point, it got them to about mid-30s. And then folks that said, but this, the, the, that's the Dories. That's, that's the Dories. You know, I'll tell you a story, this is a true story. They thought about offering a tax cut. You know, the Scottish Parliament's power, you can put tax up or put tax down. They thought about offering a tax cut. You know why they didn't do it? They tested it. They tested it around the doorsteps. They tested it in focus groups. You know what folk heard? They heard the word cut. They heard the word cut and they thought, Tory cuts. They're going to bring in. They did. They're going to bring in Tory cut, and they dropped it and went back to saying, "We'll we'll, we'll go as it is, but vote for the union. Vote for the union." So the, the, their problem now is they can get it up to about 34, 35. To get beyond that, they have to start winning votes on taxation, education, and the economy, and they're not presently able to do that. And that is where Scottish politics is is at the moment. But I, I agree with Fraser. It is eminently possible that there could be an erosion in the in the SNP vote if you know more and more issues come come together and, and, and concatenate into a problem for the SNB. Okay, more I'm great, not forecasting that, by the way. <laughs> more great questions and answers. What I'm going to do now in the interest of time, um, if you want to direct your question to a particular panel, please mm. do. If not, I'm probably going to go one question, one panellist, in the interests of time. Mm. Um, just this here on the, the edge and then the two at the front here. It's not, not particularly party political. Uh, comment on a question <laughs> that it might sound like. How many it. times have I heard that um, one going on? <laughs> just going back uh, very recently um, to the Owen, Owen Patterson <coughs> issues in Parliament. Yeah. Now, you, most of you will remember that Owen Patterson was given, took some money, which was seen to be lobbying, and then didn't declare it, I think, in the Register yeah. of Parliamentary Interests. Um, I used to be a serving civil servant. If I had taken money yeah. that way, I would have been sacked. Yeah. What happened there? Boris Johnson tried to change yeah. the rules to save Owen Patterson. Now, I try to trust politicians, but I've got to say that over the past three or four years, it's been eroded. And that one incident said a lot to me about what people in power were prepared to do to save their buddies, prevent a by-election. And I did begin to think that we're missing a bit of a trick here because the Civil Service Code is a much stronger code than what our politicians are required to serve under. So why don't we look at the Civil Service Code and bring in more elements of that to prevent the sorts of, you might say, abuses that have taken place over the past three or four years? So really, it's not party political, it's really for any of you, but I suspect that the politicians have probably got a more direct knowledge and interest of the regulation for politicians than the lay people, if I can call you, call you that. Mm -hmm. I think I'll put that one to, to Resham in the first instance. Uh, yeah, I totally agree. I think uh, politicians should not uh, be able to self-police. Um, and I think, I mean, the example you've given is one very clear one. There have been many over the years uh, from all parties, financial related, sex related, abuse related. And actually, I think the code should be much higher, it should not self-police. Um, it's very easy to get tribal and to forget that actually it is not just about defending your majority, which it should never be about, but actually that it's about serving the country and setting an example. So yes, we should bring in a stronger code. Uh, but as an example, if you're being um, emotionally, physically, sexually uh, um, kind of harassed, assaulted, whatever, by the MP you work for, you have to report that to their whip, who is their colleague, and most often their friend. Uh, and the power imbalances are incredibly challenging. They've done some work to try and fix that, but actually it's an all-round problem that's about their outward behaviour, their legal behaviour, and their conduct as employers. Um, and I do think that needs to be strengthened, because not only does it make uh, it difficult for the public to trust politicians, uh, but it also makes Parliament sometimes a less safe working place for often young people who are severely disadvantaged by that power balance. Thank you. So yes. 
two questions at the front. Um, this one here and then the front row too. Thank you. Yeah, in thinking about uh, public trust and public perceptions of politicians, I want to ask about a specific angle. Um, political communication and decision making can be highly reliant on special advisers. The Scottish Government has 18 special advisers, or SPADs. The UK Government has 126, four of which are uh, Alistair Jacks. And we've seen special advisers go from behind the scenes king makers or queen makers to Carrie Johnson, Dominic Cummings, um, Bernard Ingram, Peter Cardwell, and the list goes on. And the public engaging with shows like Borgen, The Thick of It, and so on. So my question to the panel, and the presiding officer can choose who's best suited, is what is the role and influence of special advisers on politicians that might potentially be affecting our trust because they do have a lot of sway in some ways? OK, I think I'll put this one to Fraser. Um, could I actually pass that to Brian? Oh. <laughs> he, spent an, he spent an awful lot longer around them, you know. Okay, you? okay. I, I, I was weighing up in my head between, you know, your own, your own specialist subject and, and Brian's, um, yeah, Bra Brian's you know. knowledge too, but more than happy. Thanks, Al Bunch. Yeah, 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 jo jolly great. No, they, 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 have, they have risen. They, they've risen for a, for a, uh, a, a simple reason. that the, the, the Ministers get a, a degree of support, and I'm sure our friend here gave marvellous support as a as a civil servant to, to ministers and others. They, they, they get a degree of support. But civil servants can only go so far, and quite rightly, quite rightly, they're constrained from saying, and also, minister, this would stuff it to the opposition. They, they, can't, they, can't, they can't say that. They might be tempted to say it sometimes, but they, they can't say that. So sometimes ministers need someone next to them to say, this is go this, or to say the opposite, this is going to be an absolute stinker electorally. This is really going to stink. Uh, a, a, an example was um, the, a, a policy that was kicking around this parliament for a while was that of a local income tax. Everybody was in favour of a, a local income tax, except they really weren't. Well, the Liberals had it on their policy books since, since Lloyd George. The, um, the, the, the SNP came to power and I said, we're going to have a local income tax. Then they actually looked at it. And they looked at it seriously, but with civil servants looking at it and spads looking at it, and they discovered who would lose out from a local income tax, and they discovered it was a complete stinker, and they dropped it very, very swiftly. That's the role of special advisors. Special advisors can get too easily above themselves. They can get very, very much too easily above themselves. Of the ones you mentioned, I don't think Bernard Ingham was a special advisor. I think he was a civil servant, but but, but I think he was the Downing Street um, uh, director of communications. But I'm I'm, I'm prepared to be to, to be sway, sway, swayed on that. He was certainly very very, very partisan when it came to defending the Blessed Margaret, but that, that, that's, that's a, different, a different matter. But they can, they, can get, they can get above themselves, they've got to watch when they get above themselves. I dislike it when they become um, figures of, of, uh, of public demonstration as well. You, you're right about, about um, uh, the, the, uh, the, the situation where, where they become too, too, too full, foreground. Uh, I think it's, it's, it's okay, I think it's, it's a different form of advice that can be very, very useful to, to ministers, to first ministers, to prime ministers, but it can go too far and we have to watch it. I have to, I have to be very, very careful of it. Okay. I'm going to take yourself in the front and then over here and then back there, but please continue to show hands and we'll try and fit as many as we can in the last okay. 10 minutes or so. It's a, a similar question, I think. I think the majority of politicians set off to do well. They set off to do the right thing. Yes. They think they're going into the business to make a better world, a better place for all of us. But there are, there are obviously things happen once, once they're down the air. How much does the donorship, the funding of political parties influence the policies in a way that is almost beyond the, the power of individual politicians? I'm thinking of things like the environmental thing, the, the fuel crisis just now. There's a lot of big wealthy donors, I think, influencing maybe the politicians who set out to do the right thing. Okay, Fraser? I think the, the way that funding works here, it, it makes that at least less pronounced than it would somewhere like the United States where donations are effectively unlimited. You can give as much as you want to an individual candidate, and they often will respond very directly to you know, whoever um, is kind of lying in their pocket. Um, I, 
I genuinely don't know how, how pernicious that is. I would favour, I think, moving to a, a model of public funding for political parties to kind of remove any of that suspicion, right? Because even if there isn't anything m massively untoward going on, it, it can give the impression that there is. Um, and it also, I think, depends on the party because they have very different funding models in the UK. Um, uh, yeah, I think, <laughs> I, I'm not sure if anyone else has got other thoughts on that. Um, that's pretty much all to say. I, I think if politics is presently uh, unpopular with the people, the idea of that we, we, we sponsor political parties is going to go down really badly indeed. It's, 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 a, it's in theory a, a, a splendid notion. I think it's unworkable in practice. The public would never stand for it. It's just this, the same as, you know, paying know. representatives more, right? It's I, know, a, I know. Try, it's try, try, try a pay rise I mean, for, for, for MSPs. It's not possible. With, with regard to politicians, I mean, we, 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 we elect them by, by a random means. We, we don't necessarily pay precise attention to what we're doing. And, and some of them are, are serious, powerful individuals who could hold down serious jobs in, in the, the professions or, or business. And some of them you wouldn't have sent for a message, and, and but 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 that but that is but but that but that is the joyous nature of of, of democracy. It's it's the it's the glory of democracy, and and sometimes the depression. As presiding officer, I of course have to remain <laughs> wholly, <laughs> wholly impartial at all times. Now I will try. Um, I know that we have a, a question up here, and then I'll come to yourself, and then then to you, and then. We'll have another final show of hands. And I'll maybe I'm going to take these three together and then see how we get on. Okay. My view of SPADs is that they've become too many and too expensive, yeah, probably. Though valuable in principle. <laughs> um, and do they affect or influence public appointments is another thought. However, my question on trust, yeah. going back to Brian's first remark about um, Gladstone and peerages, is it really remotely realistic or just um, burning in my antitrust in him fury that, that Boris Johnson is allegedly going to have a resignation list of how many people <laughs> who then, no doubt, along with some senior civil servants, will then have, because the scrutiny power subsequently is so poor, capacity to earn after pension after payout, if they lose office, you know, extraordinary salaries on the lecture circuit. Now, that cannot surely build trust. It can only destroy it. Okay, thank you. Um, qu two questions here in this row. And please, anyone else who'd like to put, put a question, please put your hand up. Uh, my question is probably like the compulsory voting one, a hypothetical one that oh. probably won't be realistic. Um, but what does any of the panel think um, the impact would be of free voting, if any? Uh, because I agree with you, Fraser, that represent, uh, direct democracy sorry, doesn't, it doesn't really work. And I agree with Brian that, in theory, you know, representative parliamentary democracy should work. But to me, whips and three-line whips oh, yeah. and okay. sort of that kind of being a team player and, and going against your views seems to be a real fundamental flaw of our parliamentary democracies. Um, I mean, if MPs could actually vote for what they believe in, which hopefully then Brian is what oh, they're well, representing, you know, their, their constituents they, believe they in. They can, it's just that they have some certain sanctions upon them, you know. Okay, and in this. Yeah, the original question was, can we trust politicians? But I'm just wondering, can we trust the press to good represent question. the politicians? Good question, good question. Okay, uh, thank you. There's a lot of interesting questions there. I think that one about, you, you know, free voting is sort of tied into to funding too. You know, there's, there, yeah. there's something in that. If we think about why we now have a political party system, it was in the past we had individuals who were wealthy enough to be able to go into Parliament. Um, so we, we've had a bit of a sea change there. But there is... I think that's a very big question. And who am I going to put that to? I'd like to do the peerages one. Okay, peerages. Right. Carry on, um, Because actually, I do have to say, um, with, you know, I haven't done much of my feminist chat, and I, I heard that and thought, actually, firstly, I do think there should be far greater scrutiny on uh, on the peerage process and, and making peerages. Um, I. Uh, also think, though, that we need to look at the fact that there are 92 hereditary peers, uh, and of that, 
only men can inherit those peerage titles, which means right now we are reserving 92 seats in the House of Lords at all times for men. And when we are talking about a more representative parliament, it is appalling and outrageous to me that we are still saying men deserve to be overrepresented in the House of Lords, where they have the ability to create, vote on, uh, edit, change. And the change. bishops as well, who are normally men. Yeah. Yes, yeah. The, well, those two, thank you, Brian. Yeah. Yes, exactly, more men. Uh, and so oh, we right. think, uh, you know, it's not just the calibre uh, and the quality of new peers that are going in, which I, I agree, you know, I think there should be far more... Uh, kind of attention paid to that, but the fact that we have a very big uh, house uh, with no incentive for people to retire, no incentive for people to uh, go in and actually do their work. You can get paid for just turning up and not actually doing a huge amount. Um, and whilst I am in favour of the House of Lords, uh, I think there needs to be a huge amount of work done to change it. Uh, and first off, starting with um, a campaign called Daughters' Rights, where we should make it so that men and women are equally represented. Thank you. I'm going to put the question on the free voting to yes. Fraser and then the press to Brian. Uh, yeah, so the idea of having no party discipline is a terrible one because uh, mm. <laughs> that is the kind of foundation of uh, parliamentary democracy. Um, if there was no whipping, it would be chaos and um, nothing would ever get achieved. Uh, maybe that's like a bit... <laughs> <laughs> a bit forceful of a rebuke, but um, no, I mean, in theory, it, it's again, it's like it, ideally we would all have, you know, it would be a meeting of minds and everyone would debate all the issues and come to very considered positions and vote their conscience. But um, Parliament obviously very strongly depends on party discipline. This ties, I, I don't want to tread too much on Brian here, but it ties slightly in the next question, which is about the press, mm. which is that. Since the rise of kind of TV interviews of politicians, the, there's a style of political interviewing in, in this country specifically that I find quite corrosive because it's designed to catch people. Mm. It, yes. It's almost, you're trying to trip people up about them having party loyalty and voting as they're kind of told to for the sake of party unity. And they can't, they can't on the TV say, well, oh, actually, Jeremy Parksman, I'm going to vote against this thing that you know, I've always said I was in favour of because ultimately I'd like to see a Labour government elected and I'm not going to rebel on this one little issue. <laughs> so, um, but I think, you know, political pundits have got quite a lot of mileage out of that, um, kind of aggressively pursuing people for perceived, yeah. you know, um, changes of opinion and stuff when everybody who knows what's going on knows that they're just following the, the party line. Um, but yeah, I'll, uh, on that question, Brian, can we trust the press? I'll, I'll have a go at that. I mean, mu much political discourse that we endure at the present moment is, 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 is bogus. It, it's, it's, you, you get bogus indignation voiced about your opponents. You get bogus indignation voiced about whatever they say. Um, the government or the government in, in Westminster or the Scottish government here puts forward a proposal. It is routinely condemned and damned by, by the opposition as, as, as the worst idea since the, since the slaughter of the innocents. And the, it, the, 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 those who are advocating that from the opposition benches don't believe it for a second. And those on the government benches, uh, if they're ministers, are generally, in my experience, in a lather of indecision all of the time, an honourable lather of decision all of the time, because they're taking extremely tough decisions. Why do they persist in this bogus nonsense? Because they have been taught that that's what gets them on the telly and gets them in the press. And we need a truce. We need, we need, we need honest reporting in, 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 res, in return for honest discourse. And so my minister is standing up and saying, I don't know, I haven't got a clue. What do, you, what do you reckon? And that would be the honest position generally. But they have to stand up and sound certain and they have to sound precise and sound vigorous. Now, when, I, when I've, I've made these sort of remarks before, I generally f finish with, well, follow it with, with one remark, which is, trust me, I'm a journalist. <laughs> yeah, that always gets the response. So I'm going to show you, I'm going to show you that you can trust me. I've got the T-shirt. Look at that. <laughs> trust, me, I'm a, trust me, I'm a reporter. I got that at the Washington Museum, which was a wonderful place. Uh, a wonderful place, but the, which, which uh, it, it was about some of the glories that have been in, in press coverage. There really have been some good things done by press people. I think of 
you know, the, the exposure of thalidomide, I think of, of the, the bringing down various policies and challenging various policies. Does it go too far? Yes, it does. But what concerns me mostly is when it becomes, when it becomes bogus, when, when, when you, you are covering a discourse that you know is, 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 is fake, and, and yet you persist in doing it because it gets on page one or it gets on, on the telly. And, I, and if we could break that cycle, I don't, don't, I'm not sure who first started it, whether it was you know, obfuscating politicians or whether it was over-eager journalists, but we need to break that, that cycle and, and One find a way out. One very quick thing is we yeah. do have the option to vote as well on, you know, with our money or with our clicks online. If you see a newspaper that has Nicola Sturgeon and Theresa May and it's a, an up kind of leg shot of their legs and it says legs it, don't read it, don't buy it, don't click on it. If you see an article about women in Downing Street and what they're wearing when they get promoted to the cabinet, don't click on it because if we stop reading this stuff, uh, this junk that rewards people for taking sexist yeah. or populist views that are harmful to society, harmful to women or people from BME backgrounds or different social backgrounds coming into Parliament. If we stop reading it, they'll stop yeah. writing it. Now, I know we're out of time, but I am aware of two um, people at the back who do like to ask a question. See, now, oh, now, I'm going to take these two questions. We're going to answer them briefly and then we'll definitely be, be finished. So we'll take... One after the other. Thank you. Uh, hi. Um, first of all, just going to say I, I can um, appreciate Resham's words on the centre because I actually did do the internship, um, well, this year and last year, and I can say from well, first hand, it is really good. So um, thanks to him for that. Um, but my, my question's on proportional representation, um, and it seems to me there's a couple of benefits in terms of trust that come with that. So well, if you have PR, then you'd have you know, not the duopoly of um, Tories and Labour, right? So, hold on, how's it going up? One. Um, so, yeah, I'm thinking you'd have more, um, more turnover of different parties, which means you couldn't say as much, oh, they're all the same, because in a sense, they are, because it's only two parties, really, that you're choosing from. And then also, if you had more coalitions, say, like in Europe, then you'd show the public, you'd kind of demonstrate to the public the value and the reality of compromise and also of politicians changing their minds. Like, for example, the, the green energy minister in Germany has decided to, you know, restart coal power plants because of the, the energy crisis they're in right now. And that's, that's a massive compromise there. Um, and you're not really going to get this sort of thing without PR. I'm just wondering your thoughts on that. Yep, thank you. And just to the, the row in front. Um, I was wondering what the panel's thoughts on what structural reforms or policies could be used to shore up trust in politicians to try and make this question less relevant. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, we will we'll answer these two huge questions within the next few in minutes. 30 seconds, yeah. I think I'll, I'll go to Fraser though. Would proportional representation, what, what role might it have in increasing trust in politicians? It's a really tough question because as you know, if you look across the world in you know comparative studies, countries that have PR do tend to have better overall outcomes in terms of satisfaction with democracy, political trust, even um, you know like GDP stuff. Um, they, they tend to just be better places. However, because we've had such a strong, um, you know, the Westminster. Um, style of politics is very, very deeply embedded here. The, the Scottish Parliament was kind of designed with that in mind as a, a negative template. That was, I think that was the phrase that the Constitutional Convention used. Mm -hmm. um, but I think it's, you know, they've found it very, very difficult to, to kind of escape that, that mould. Um, and people have a hard time even now accepting kind of coalition governments in a UK context. So I'm not sure if it would work transplanted here. I mean, I, Personally, I would, I would be in favour of it because um, I think first past the post incentivises a lot of um, bad things, but I don't know if it would improve political trust. It might even dent it because people don't, they don't want compromise. They want their side to win because um, that's what they've been kind of, you know, trained to expect. Yeah. I mean, of course, we have a local government level. Um, so, well, as you'll appreciate, we have many different electoral systems yeah, yeah. Um, which can cause confusion and, and uncertainty. But on the question of structural reform that might engender greater 
trust in politicians. If you were to do one thing, I'm going to ask Resham and then Brian, mm. what would that be? Uh, I think making the MPC independent was a brilliant move in 97. Um, I don't really remember what it was like before, but from what I've read. Um, and I would suggest setting something up for housing and climate change, similar independent bodies with funding to do things separate to government so that actually they could look decades ahead uh, and set up things that were separate to electoral cycles. I, I would go further with the, a reform that was brought into the Scottish Parliament, which was the idea of, of, of enhancing and, and consultation by having pre-legislative scrutiny. It's been used, I believe, very um, effectively by, by many of the committees. I, I would try and go further with that and, and try and lose this, the, any, any suggestion that it is in some way just a, you know, a patronising way of, of, of tapping public views. I would go really, really down with that and try and get that involved so that before we get to the legislative stage, we have examined the, 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 the detailed um, content of, of the proposal. And, and I would, I, so I would, I would go with that and make, make that a, a really big change. I, I, I think it's, it's, politics is still, it's still working away. It's still, still getting there. And I, I believe there have been some, some absolutely dreadful examples of, of malfeasance. But, but I think we should still seek to trust it and still seek to build upon it. I think it was Churchill said that, 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 that democracy is the, absolutely the worst system of government in the world, except for all the others. And I, I'm, I'm, I'm kind, of, kind of with him on that one. Because if you don't have a democratic system, if you have, uh, if you talk about trust in politicians, if you have the opposite, if you have adulation for politicians, then th that way lies dictatorship. So I would, I would say be sceptical, don't be cynical, be, be questioning, don't be con condemnatory. And I think that way we can get a decent balance. And on that note, we will draw this event to a close. Can I thank you all for your contributions, for your participation in this really interesting event? Um, can I ask you to join me in thanking our panellists and thanking <laughs> Reshan Patekha, Brian Taylor and Dr Fraser McMillan. Can I also thank to our partners at the John Smith Centre yes. and can I take this opportunity to remind everyone that the festival continues there's going to be a lively discussion, I am sure, on the State of the Union at 6pm and an in conversation with poet and author Lem Sissy about his memoir, My Name Is Why, and that starts at half past six. Thank you again. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you. That was excellent. Well done. Well, really good. Well, chair. Well, chair. Very good.